I remember that um, Gwendolyn Brooks said, through the portrait of Winnie Mandela, I pass you my poem. My poem is life, and it can grow. And you know, I've seen over the last 20 years poetry at JMU grow. And to, today is just one example of the richness that we bring you through Furious Flower. So I'm happy that you're here, and I want you to sit back, relax, maybe not too much, because I'd like you to ask questions at the end. Uh, we'll probably have about 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. And um, take advantage of the wonderful, wonderful brain and spirit that we will have before you. We also have books in the back. Yona Harvey's most recent book, Hemming the Water, is back there. Is that right? And there aren't that many copies. So those of you who get back there first can get a copy and then get her to sign it at the end. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Elizabeth Hoover, who is the assistant director of the uh, Furious Flower Poetry Center, and also a very, very good friend of our guest speaker. And she's going to introduce her to you right now. So let's welcome Elizabeth Hoover. Oh, come on, come on, Elizabeth. I always want to do the right thing. Whenever there is a board member for the Furious Flower Advisory Board in the house, I will always recognize that person. Carter Douglas, would you please wave? And let's welcome Carter Douglas, who really supports the Furious Flower Poetry Center. Hello. Is this on? OK. I'm really excited uh, to introduce Yona Harvey to you. Um, we're both uh, Yinzers which is the name for people who either live in or are from Pittsburgh and have deep ties to Pittsburgh. Um, because in Pittsburgh, we don't say y'all, we say yins. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pittsburgh's kind of a, has some weird, weird slang associated with it. All right, this will be the formal. I'll do the formal one now. <laughs> Yona Harvey begins her debut book of poetry, Hemming the Water, with the image of a girl in a red scarf who stands apart from the others and understands that sound is God. Yona writes, what does the girl with the red scarf hear? Only she knows, approaching the world from the inside in. This image is also a perfect portrait of Yona, her poetry comes from careful listening to the music of language around her. She is an avid collector of phrases. Found language is knitted into her own idiosyncratic cadence, a cadence that is deliberate and careful as she considers women harvesting blue crabs, women looking through thrift store clothes, women struggling with girdles. I urge you to listen with equal care so you can delight in Yona's beautiful phrases and her startling transitions. In her work, Yona also reminds us that inside of our ear is a drum. It was actually the first time that I thought about the idea that we refer to the ear, the, that is the ear drum, and that becomes a metaphor um, to tell us that inside of our listening is an instrument that can make music the music of women reaching beyond the fitting rooms of the earth, the music of women who take chances on blouses will wear brazenly as middle fingers. And the ear and the drum and the heart of this book is Mary Lou Williams, the pioneering swing pianist from Pittsburgh. Williams spent her career innovating, constantly expanding her style from the bebop of the 1940s into the dissonance of avant-garde jazz in the 1960s and beyond. Williams' innovation took her beyond easy categorization as a musician. And judging from Yona's marvelous debut, 
we can expect the same from the career of this adventurous literary artist. Please welcome Yona Harvey. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a really great introduction. That's Pittsburgh. And thank you, Dr. Gavin, for inviting me here to Furious Flower. Thank you all for coming. I can't believe there are so many students here for poetry. It's a beautiful thing. You're surrounded by very talented poets. Elizabeth is also a very talented poet in her own right. So, um, yeah, lucky ducks. Good. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Heather Banks. Um, she was my English professor at Howard University a long, long time ago when I was just a little baby, didn't even know I was going to be a poet. Um, but her support, which I imagine is similar to the support that you get here, really is instrumental in me being here. Uh, that encouragement goes a long way. She says those poems were good, and I look back like, hmm. <laughs> OK. Uh, I think I'm going to start and read this poem with the drum in it, since it came up before. Um, and also because, you know, a lot of people come along with me in my poems. So this is sound part two, hearing my daughter's heartbeat the first time. And there's uh, three epigraphs. Kadoom, kadoom doom, kadoom, kadoom doom, the heart, the heartbeat, the heart beats slow, and that's Etheridge Knight. Now I have beaten a song back into you. That's Yusuf Komanyaka. And finally, furious music of the little drum whose body was still in Africa, but whose soul sung around a fire in Alabama, flourish, break. And that's Zora Neale Hurston. It's the girl in deep water who will not drown drum, come down, drum, come down, drum, Zora's instrument hidden in the belly, drum, carried across the Atlantic, drum, it's a mystery to master, drum, it don't stop, drum, don't stop, drum, got a story to tell, drum, won't stop, drum, Gold black fish drum, swimming drum. An old one come back drum, blood drum, breath drum, memory drum, kadoom drum, kadoom drum, kadoom, kadoom, kadoom. There's a lot of snow and cold weather in my poem, so completely opposite from this environment. <laughs> I think that's also the Pittsburgh influence. Uh, to describe my body walking. To describe my body walking, I must go back to my mother's body walking with an aimless switch in this moment of baptismal snow or abysmal flurry. There's a shadow of free fall frenzy and her unhurried, the way snowflakes are unhurried toward transformation at my living room window. She moves unlabored she will not ask me to invite her in, but she will expect it. I will open the door to her. She 
is my mother. Even if she is made of snow and ice and air and the repetition of years, a means, a ways. She came out of trees surrounding me. I see her cross, now the creek in her patent leather shoes, their navy glimmer like a slick hole I might peer over and fall into against so much snow weighing down the prayerful arms of sycamores which doused the bushes last autumn. Her little hearse broke down near the exit that leads to my house. Now she must walk. She will be tired. I will let her in, though she will not ask. She has come so far past the mud, the abandoned nests. This time of year, she can't tell the living from the dead. The pathway is mostly still, except for her moving with the snow, becoming the snow. Forgiveness, she is a stamp in it. The tapping of boots at the porch steps, not spring or summer, just her advancing, multiplying, falling through branches. There's a flurry of her. Um, so my mother is a, a Pentecostal minister and uh, she became ordained later in my life, like around the time I was an undergraduate in college, but I grew, she raised me in that church, in that environment. And um, so I think that is my connection to music and obviously black culture sound and um but my mom is a very complicated uh person so she she's a minister but she's also the person who taught me about earth wind and fire and etta james and you know so there's a lot of contradictions and things moving back and forth so if you hear that i think she is like someone at the root of that um sound. Hair cranked up, voices cranked up, hands and necks snake to shape the words. Girls predict rain and raise cane on campus, on street corner, at movie and makeup counter. Each voice amped by the other, little luminous leaves egged on by fast winds ensuring wild, wild weather. When my mother spoke freely, echoes of her girlhood rose from the Lincoln courts, each playground chant. I listened the way old women listen to gods and spirits who visit. They pour chamomile to ease the spirit. They give freely their ears their tongues then stop mid-sentence as if they shouldn't be speaking. When my mother's mouth slipped open like a blouse, she lowered her eyes and covered it suddenly. Salt palmed, panicked, I braced the smart mouth and ornery of English and algebra class, fought a similar silence. I've trembled among strangers and lovers turned strangers. My small voice collapsed in solitary song. I sit across from people in restaurants, clenching spoons, afraid of what we might say. You're so encouraging. That's very sweet. <laughs> um, Okay, this is called Discovering Girdles. 
but probably nowadays it would be dic discovering really? Spanx. <laughs> uh, discovering girdles. I don't know what to do with this contraption of polyester and cotton, troublesome lace, black, white, another woman's nude, whatever the color. Its trick is to hide flesh, to constrict the skin like a bit of truth, a secret buried in the garden of women's undergarments. A prepubescent girl signals her mother to quiet, to lower what must be her first bra, and yes, it's fine, and can she go now? My mother's concerns for me were body odor and virginity. How to smell like a flower without being plucked. <laughs> Robust women filled her church, their stomachs suffusing the linen of long dresses doused with perfume. I do not know how to behave publicly, contemplating these hip huggers that wouldn't matter to those women reaching beyond the fitting rooms of earth. <laughs> I'll switch. As you can see, I'm very, uh, my family, my kids, I wrote this book over a long, long period of time, about 10 years. So in that time, I had two children, and um, a lot of times I would have to hold the sound of a poem in my head for really long periods over the course of the day until I could get to the place where I could write it. Um, and so, also, a lot of folk tales and children's book sounds come into the work for that reason, too. They're really, really great devices to hang onto the poem. So, that is my setup for Hurricane. Because the thing is, I always say this, um, you know, in youth, you sometimes criticize your parents or your mother and then life comes right back at you and you have kids of your own um, hurricane so uh only thing you need to know i guess is my daughter was born in new orleans and she, she grew up in pittsburgh it's like now i'm stuck on pittsburgh now <laughs> And uh, every spring in Pittsburgh, there's a carnival that comes to down, comes to town, and it's real, real rickety. It's very, very shady. I don't know. So when my daughter was really small, she said to me, I want to get on this ride. And the ride was called the Hurricane. So it's me, her father, her little brother, and we're all looking like there is no way in the world. Any, none of us want to get on this ride with you. It looks crazy. So we're like talking back and forth, thinking, what are we gonna do? She really wants to get on the ride, and then she just puts up her hand and says, just give me the tickets, I'll go by myself. And I let her go. <laughs> and then I felt really, really bad about that. Like, oh, I'm a bad mother. Um, and so this poem was born out of that experience. Hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> Four tickets left, I let her go. First born into a hurricane. I thought she escaped the floodwaters. No, but her head is empty of the drowned for now though she took her first breath below sea level. Ah, ah, and ah, mama, let me go. She speaks what every smart child knows. To get grown, you unlatch 
your hands from the groan and up and up and up and up she turns latched in the seat of a hurricane you let your girl what you let your girl what i did so she do i did so she do so girl you can ride a hurricane and she do and she do and she do and she do she do make my river an ocean memorial Baptist, Protestant, birth. My girl walked away from a hurricane. And she do, and she do, and she do, and she do. She do take my hand a while longer. The haunts in my pocket I'll keep to a hum. Katrina was a woman I knew. When you were an infant, she rained on you, and she do, and she do, and she do, and she do. Mm. Sound, part three, ostinato. All the world's wars commence in the head. Hunched in a thimble, I wept. Mercy. Once blotted out trees. Well, made some second guess me speak. Ought not act so ugly. Said, ought not act so ugly. Hunched in a thimble, I wept. Yes, yes, won't make no apologies. No, sir, who will take on this burden? Ought not walk alone, said. Ought not walk alone. In my sleep, I wandered. The way they do you said that's the way they do you words can make a mountain said words can make a mountain no pulpits in the thimble said no pulpits in the thimble Head ha, head ha, said head, shoulders, knees, and legwork ought not act so ugly, ought not act so ugly. Head, shoulders, knees, and legwork, no room for one more, no room for one more don't go pray for me don't go pray for me no acres for want in a thimble said no acres for want in a thimble all i could do was roll said all i could do was roll mm -hmm. <coughs> stitch S stitch S stitch S stitch S stitch I know not what 
I know not. probably come up in the Q&A, but I'll just say now. Um, that poem comes from just playing a little bit with code switching and some adult things that you maybe can't say around children that you code. And so I like to suggest things with the sound. So the stitch, you could be imaginative and guess you know, where that might go. Um, and I also feel like an allegiance to performance poems and poets. For some reason, I think that there's this separation that people try to like push. And so it's very important for me, even though I work a lot on the page, um, to acknowledge that when I was young, I love that culture. I love spoken word culture, and I'm not trying to separate myself from that and there's a hell of a lot of talent in that community so I'm always making sure that I'm touching that in my life and in my work so and, you know when people come at me with that I just get more stubborn about it so okay I'm gonna step out of this book for a little bit and um I'll read this poem called The Baseline. So now my son's older, and mostly my kids, are they're rebellious too. I don't know where they got that from. And they are like, I don't want to go to any poetry readings. I don't want to hear poetry. I don't want to talk about it, whatever. Because <laughs> we used to, my husband's a poet, and so we would take them to a lot of readings, and they totally rebelled. However, my son did say to me not that long ago, where's the poem about me? There's all these poems about his sister. So, um, this poem comes from his life. It's also, he just started basketball season again, so I think it's cool to read that. The Bass Line. NBA season, the finals, and I was in a neurosurgeon's waiting room, awaiting Arrow's test results. He'd slammed his skull on the baseball court and his pupils pulsed cartoony. Black spirals and asterisks and loony exclamations. His dizzy days had placed us before the clipboards of chance snapping. Dr. Phil was interviewing a boy who'd killed his mother, specifically bashed his mother's head with a sledgehammer and set her house on fire. It's ritual, said the doc. It's self-soothing to bash someone's head, to set a house on fire. I don't know, doc. I don't know America. I don't know. I forget how daytime gnaws us till evening if we linger too long in its jaws. Everything wrong with us seemed to glow from the insides of a flat screen. I wondered what was up next, a razor? A switchblade, a machete, little bits of bone, the boy's little blonde brother nearly dying too. I don't know, homemakers. I don't know, ratings. A nurse walked Arrow to an exam room. Free throws and foul shots chatter. Winners and losers, favorite players. LeBron James slept somewhere between games. I was stressed about Grand Theft Auto and Netflix. How many times had Arrow hit his head in the past few years? Bring it in, Arrow said when I joined him. Chill, he said. Did this mean 
He was the kind of son who'd hug his mother tightly before turning away. The kind of kid who'd leave home at 12 and assemble a band and adorn his fro with feathers and cowries and swear he'd learn the birds and the bees from the internet? I don't know, worst fears. What was the last thing Arrow remembered? A thwacking, the court's distant border. I forget how competitive he gets. I forget how fragile. Diagnosis, no games, three weeks, supervised exercise, rest. I don't know, inevitable. My mother didn't care much for television. Turn that stuff off, she'd say. Talk to me. What makes a child turn? How does a head bash in? I forget how mustache begins in shadow, how hairlines fade gradually. One year, Cleveland fans burned LeBron's jersey. I don't know, Christians. I don't know, Cavaliers. I forget how every son leaves us at least once. I forget how quiet a house without television. Son, don't bring any spiders home or lovers or trash talk. I forget how we leave those anyway. I forget how hypnotic the television. Eat your dinner, son. Eat your dinner. And I'll just finish with two more poems from the book. Mm. Which two? The shape compassion takes. Until a moment ago, maybe its bands were great fish chanting in water. The sound of Mabius more hypnotic than paper striving to be infinite and classic like famous whales or wannabe singers. And then I turned my head to a page in a book. I was 11 or 12. It was a lesson on the verb to be or it was a lesson about creation. I was 16 or 17. What did I know about DNA or the birthplaces of King, Gandhi, or Sappho? How quickly can you locate Atlanta, Porbandar, or Lesbos on a map? I tried to resist puritanical answers. I tried to trust what my head could accomplish. I was 19 or 21. I wasn't ignoring the elephant in the room, but gazing upon its magnificent toenails, the fossilized history between them. I was 27 or 28. I spoke often to myself. In an emergent process, two is more than twice as many as one. Do not fear this idea. There was you born to a certain family of a certain city. And then there was you becoming another woman entirely, speaking in the antelope's voice. Or was it the jackal's? When a herd mourns a fallen calf in the plain, the youngest survivor circles back to bless her sister. She suspects the body will take the form of a dragonfly or maybe the shape compassion takes. You can speak of this if you want. Give yourself permission. It's hard to know 
It's hard not to loop back toward those daydream-inspired turns at the front of a storm-colored schoolroom where no one, not even the teacher, was listening. I was 33 or 34. I wanted God. I wanted science to predict, explain, intervene, but she couldn't or he wouldn't or it wouldn't, and so I sat, <coughs> not paralyzed, but something like it, lukewarm on gospel, a loose shell in a tambourine, waiting for rapture. Amen. And I will end with a poem for Toni Morrison. In Toni Morrison's head. In Toni Morrison's head, white girls die first, which means I'm still alive, but breathless and on the run in the brain's maze of scrutiny. How I stumble in the memory of Ohio, old names and faces given me. Pecola, Dorcas, Violet, Violet, Nell, First Corinthians. Reinvention is my birthright. With each step, I am altered. Mother, daughter, river, son. A tree swells on my dark back, and no one waits in the future to kiss me. Only the townswomen hissing at my inappropriate dress, but not at the sweet-talking rogue who travels with me. Inside the mire, my heart still pulses at first, fatigued and death-bound, then quick. There's not enough milk for all these babies or the blue-eyed dolls yanking their mouths open and shut. Give a little clap, 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 chant the children. And there's something ancient about the music's call to order. Put them in your lap. Who wouldn't stop to trace the scars on the wall their embroidery of skin, stitches that stretch for miles. Not I, says the jolly old woman, disappearing through a warm tunnel, asking, Tony, won't you tell me a funny story? I cut my losses and sprint. I'm smoke, I'm ash, holy ghost and crucifix. The preacher reborn to a body in the grass, chirping, death is so much different than I imagined. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm going to moderate questions. Oh, OK. Um, mm -hmm. So instead of moving the mic, if you could just speak up. Does that sound good? Um, I hope this is mine. That is yours. <laughs> and um, just to give you a couple minutes to think of your first question. So in my introduction, I talked about Mary Lou Williams. Mm -hmm. And then you didn't read anything about Mary Lou Williams. I'm not sure <laughs> have. So can you talk a little bit about what Mary Lou Williams mm. meant to you and to this book? Well, she was so brilliant. She was a brilliant pianist and composer. And um, the short version of the story is that one of my poetry idols, Yusuf Komanyaka, when I was really, really young, we were at, I was in his workshop at this place at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. And so Yusuf Komanyaka is a man who just very few words. I think he's maybe said 10 words to me in his whole life. <laughs> and ten of, part of those words were, you should write a poem about Mary Lou Williams. <laughs> and he said this when we were walking down the street together. And I was like, 
okay? <laughs> and then I thought, holy sh, who is Mary Lou Williams? I gotta go like learn about Mary Lou Williams. And so that's when I first started to listen to her music. But it took, I mean, I was really, really young then. I mean, it, years and years, 20, at least 20 years of listening to her music before I ever actually wrote about her. And so I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned is when I first moved to Pittsburgh, I lived across the street from the cemetery where she was buried, and I didn't even know. So then I moved somewhere else, and my family took me to her tomb grave site for Mother's Day. And I was like, man, we used to live right there the whole time. I was like writing about her and listening to her music. But the point is, I said I was going to tell the short version. <laughs> She lived through all the eras of jazz. I mean, and people have never heard of her, but they know all the people who she composed for. So, like Thelonious Monk and Benny Goodman, all these people, she was a huge influence on their art. And so, the, all of the changes in the book are really how I interpret the way that she worked. So, I, don't, I have less poems. I don't really have any poems that are sort of Mary Lou Williams biographical poems. I internalized her tenacity, her skill, and her, like, her movement, her, the way she could just transform herself and just keep <coughs> pushing and pushing and pushing record after record. And so that's really what I think I try to keep alive in the book. That's her. And women, 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 like the network of women. So. You know what was so interesting, um, just about two years ago, Chuck Douglas, who is a professor here mm -hmm. at JMU, uh, did a whole suite on her music. Wow, okay. And the music of those uh, people that she composed for, like the only Man, and others. It was fantastic. I wish I could have been here yeah, for that. <laughs> well, we're, we're, <laughs> we're lucky now because Jerry Allen is the music director at the University of Pittsburgh, where I teach now, and she is a huge. Mary Lou Williams fan too, so we have like a little love fest all the time, you know. So <laughs> it's really great having her in Pittsburgh too. All right, we're gonna open it up. Question. <laughs> well, I have one. Okay. I know somebody back here that asked the question. <laughs> okay. I'm looking at my students. <laughs> but um, I, I do have a question. I, I was I was not aware of the Pentecostal background. Mm -hmm. I should have been. You're not necessarily. Some of the references, but um, was it which one? <coughs> was it the Church of God in Christ, or was it Assemblies of God? Assemblies of God. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 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 somebody's going to ask about the stitches. <laughs> The stitches. Yes. Um, I just think you know, as a, you know, st well, <laughs> my mother was also a seamstress. Clearly, she is a huge force in my life, a huge complicated force. So that visually, the stitches when I draw them out, they look like buttonholes on the page. So that's the visual design. But that S is also like. You know, girls cut and at each other in a certain kind of way. So there's a kind of like a yeah. little bit of a meanness in there, a twist, you know. And uh, it's also like a snake. It's slithery. So there's like Garden of Edenish stuff and all the mythology around that. And then also a feeling of being talked about or someone doing something to you. So I just try to suggest things with the sounds. So I like to see if I could, I just put that challenge out there for myself. Could I suggest any kind of like conflict and opposition, <coughs> meanness, just through the sound and people whispering and that's the way they do you, you know? And it's never really clear what they, did or said, but I like <coughs> making that space and just staying in it a little bit and not being afraid to engage it. 
I do think that they're very clever kids. I mean, maybe everybody thinks that about their kids, but they're real quick, you know? So I see in their language and their humor, especially from a very early age, even when I know that they're making fun of me, you know? So I, I hear it in that the language, the way that they interact with one another, especially when they think I can't hear them. And they're also visual artistic kind of kids too, you know, so they paint and they draw and they make pottery and so that's how I see it for now. I don't know where they're going to go with that, but. And then in the last row, if you could just speak up, Avi, for everyone. Oh, uh, Do you want me to come back? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. There is another one. This is less of like a question question, but could you talk about um, the way you weave tone and diction and your rhythm? Because I was really interested in a lot of um, your tone goes up half steps and then goes down half steps real quickly afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like a, a whole step down from the half step up. Anyways, it's like um, like a swing is how I felt. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk more on that? Sorry, it's not another question question. Should I wait? <laughs> I, well, I don't, I can't, I'm, I love music and I like to improvise a little bit when I read the poems. So part of it is that, just kind of experimenting with how I can stretch the sound out. You know, I cannot sing, I really, so I feel that this is the closest that I could get to being in music, living in music, I guess, like Ntozaki Shange said. Um, so that's, that's really it. That's probably what you are speaking of. I just, it's hard, you know, you write the book, and you live with it for a long time, and then you read from it over and over again. So it's almost like I like to create a new song or a new story with it when I read the poems, and that's what you hear me doing. And I, I think that's also connected to Mary Lou Williams' influence. Does that answer the question? Okay. I was so, so moved by both poems about your children. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with your daughter, Hurricane, and your son. Um, I suppose I wanted to just say that. But also, um, I, I, I want to I wanna understand um, how do you deal with that, kind, that feeling of letting go? Mm. I mean, in both poems, you are letting go. Right. And as a mother, that was one of the hardest things for me to do. Sure. My daughter's 41 years old now, and I still <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, yeah. Well, I think we're sometimes our better selves or our ambitions, we deal with our fears in the work. So I don't feel that I really have, but it's clearly an obsession of mine. And so I can feel soothed a little bit by it in a poem. But I, I haven't really let them go yet, you know? <laughs> Oh, I, I thought I saw a hand in the back. Do we have a question? Yes, yes. Um, so I have a number of students from my class mm -hmm. on a survey of African American literature, and we've been talking all semester about signifying. And mm -hmm. you you mentioned in your epigraphs, you you, know, you call out Zora Neale Hurston, Etheridge Knight, Yusuf Kobanyaka, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see yourself responding to um, the black community of writers and, and what that response is like, how you would characterize 
what you think your obligation is as a writer to people like those that you've listed. Yeah, I feel it is a continued conversation. It's not even an obligation, it's like a, their odes, you know, that it's, there's so much excitement. I feel so happy to have read and met some of these writers when I was so young. And those words, those books, they have really stuck with me. And so it's a, just a legitimate turning over and turning over and turning over of those sounds. So like, say, Tracy Morris, um, she came to Howard when I was there and she read Etheridge Knight's poems. And I had read his work before, but I was just blown away. I mean, I can still hear her all these years later, kadooming, kadooming, kadooming that poem. And so I feel it's a way, not to go back there, but it's a way to communicate that that is where my work comes from, that I didn't just appear here, that it's like on a spectrum, you know? So that's really like how I see tradition. Happily, very so glad for it. Yeah. 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 Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your inclusion of kind of um, contemporary terminology in some of your poems. I noticed <coughs> the poem about your son, uh, for example, was the first time I'd ever heard the word Netflix in a poem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was just so cool. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Thanks. I, I think it's new. So. I feel a little bit more relaxed about that. Like when I first started writing and even teaching sometimes, I would say, oh, they don't need us. They have their own advertising. <laughs> so I would sort of shy away from that. But I guess probably because of the influence like of my children, again, you know, it is a legitimate concern and it does mark a certain time. So I feel much more relaxed about it now and comfortable and I feel, I hope, that I can still bring a kind of music to the line and that it would still work, you know? And, yeah, Grand Theft Auto and Netflix, that does conjure crazy stuff for me. Visually, you just have to say those few things and so much comes, so much is tied up in there and then that's all the work I have to do and I can keep going. So, does that yeah. answer? Okay. And sound. I think it's when I'm walking around, it's sound first because people just say all kinds of crazy things. Like nobody thinks anybody is anybody out in the world. <laughs> so I mean, I'm just like shocked at the things that people say around me. I'm like, don't you know I'm going to be like, I'm going to take that with me. I mean, <laughs> they're like, who is this lady? I don't care. So it's like a lot of borrowed conversations and sounds that stick with me that way. But then there's this whole um, visual thing that I love. I do think I'm a more visual thinker and writer, believe it or not. So there's a lot of poems in the book, like, say, gingivitis notes on fear. It's like these two columns. So there's the sound of it, the, where the poem comes from. But then also my daughter, there's this image of her looking in the mirror at her front tooth. One of her teeth has fallen out, and the other one's just coming in. And at the time, there was a lot about ter it wasn't the original 9-11, but maybe around anniversary time. So I was thinking about like fear and what's everybody protecting. And so I just, when the poem started to take shape, it took on the towers and her teeth coming in. So I was just kind of mixing the landscape, the cityscape, and also the domestic things that I see in domestic life. And I like that. It's kind of a private thing. I, I, I wouldn't expect anybody to necessarily pick up on that in the book, but it is a, a way that I like manage a little bit of 
control <laughs> over it and the design. So if people know, fine, if they don't. But that satisfies those two things, to me, that are very important, image, the visual, and the oral, so. So I think we have time for one more. If anyone was holding back. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.